Hi, I'm Heinbach. It's good to have you back. Welcome to the June Patreon Q&A, where everybody who supports what I do on Patreon can ask questions and I will try to answer them as best as I can on video. If you want to get some questions in, just subscribe to any tier on the Patreon and check for the thread that I put up there every month. Before we go to the Q&A, a few announcements. My installation Landfill Totems is up again at patch point and this time as a playable no touch patch because we mixed everything that's at patch point basically search and see at Lombard through the DR horn organ for which I made a video and that can be used as a no touch mixer. So I set up a patch and then the people at patch point answered that and you can morph through this patch and if this video is out there will already have been an opening but you can visit the place and check it out there and pick up some lovely banana synthesizers while you're at it. I will put a link in the description where you'll see opening times and location exactly. There will be a show of the landfill totems again also at patch point but of course it will be rather limited so maybe I'll a limited attendance uh, due to COVID-19 so we might just live stream it. Next Fundamental the VST I developed together with Sonic Lab is almost out of the intro offer so you've got one more week where you can buy it at the discounted price after that it's going on full price so if you haven't checked it out yet go download the demo and see if it works for you and then you can buy it for I think 20 euros off and anybody who has ordered my record assertion good news the pressing plant is finished with the pressing of the records and they're just going over to Chase Bliss and Chase Bliss is sending them out and if you've ordered via patch point the records are coming over and yeah then patch point will send them out too. So that's it for news let's go to the Q&A. Gaitan Hello, sorry to make you pronounce my name again. I hope I did it right. <laughs> With all the old electronics, heavy metal boxes and shelves full of questionably hanging stuff around you. Mm. I'm not that questionable. <laughs> anyway, maybe. <laughs> Have you already been injured by gear? Share your war stories with us. Thanks. I've been shocked and that's on camera. I think I was shocked all in all three times. All through my own fault all because I just yeah I just didn't take proper care and uh, yeah that sucked but uh, that was the worst the second worst was when one of these things this lovely brilliant Kia bunt pass filter which is really chunky and heavy I think three kilograms or something it doesn't look like it I had it that was when I was still like building the rack I had it up there it fell down, fell on my head, uh, gave me a nice little bump, fell on another piece of equipment, completely smashed it, but of course was completely unscathed. This is, this is the toughest gear. This is gear to destroy other gear. So brilliant gear. Yeah, dangerous stuff. <laughs> Gus Elizondo. I recently listened to Assertion, just waiting on a payment to actually buy it. And it's the first album I've heard from you, even though I've been following you on YouTube almost from the beginning. For some reason I was expecting atonal bleeps bloops with weird percussive sounds. But I heard a lot of tonal stuff with a relatively normal rhythm section. What was your approach to make this sound tonal with a normal rhythm while using all the gear we love to see and use? Whew, um, the thing is, I've made a lot of more, uh, how would you say, uh, normal music for a long time. Very, yeah, very... Yeah, rather dancey Eurorack modular stuff and my album The Heat for example you can check out that for lots more in that vein but the ambient stuff simply went further people were more interested in that and also because two albums that I had made in a similar vein yeah they weren't released because the labels folded and now I can't fit them in any narrative anymore so I'm probably gonna yeah put them in a library or something and uh, yeah that's kind of a shame but that's how it went for me but with assertion the one thing that was really important to me was to make it hopeful and I didn't want to do a 20 30 minute uh, isolation drone tracks or anything I wanted this to be everything but depression so I 
went to the music that I love. I, there, um, there's a Spotify playlist that you can check out when you look on Spotify for Heinberg, which cites some of the influences. And those are very much crowd rock, uh, Roto, um, Neu, uh, all this. You can find that in this hopeful album. And there are some darker parts in there, but in general, the vibe was supposed to be uplifting. I wanted to lift myself up from all the darkness and yeah, all the threat that happened. So that was the reason behind it. I think there was another question related to assertion. Ah, Lars uh, Jedalund question. With the latest track in collaboration with a drummer friend, uh, Mason Music, you are apparently diving into more melodic stuff, which is great, by the way. Is that so? Do you think it might broaden your audience? Well, according to my Spotify stats, it does. I mean, I got so much more listeners, uh, <laughs> like, I don't know, 500% more from Assertion, uh, which is pretty great. But I don't do, like, I don't do... Heinbach for <laughs> success, basically. I do it for uh, for what I want to do. It's more about the art for me. So if I feel pressure to do certain kinds of music, I get an anti-reaction, anti so I would do something else. But generally, I feel I want to explore that vein more because it's just one of the facets of my work. I've got uh, two albums already recorded for this year, which will be coming out. And uh, they will be different. And uh, one will be a test equipment record, a follow-up to Impulse Generator, which I'm super happy about and uh, very proud. And the other one will be a soft ambient release. Um, so there might be room for something similar to Assertion, but that's definitely something I want to go about when I feel like it and maybe something more for next year. Cosmos Kiste, hey, can you tell us about an exceptional place on Earth where you would really love to record new sounds? Example, Cave Volcano Jungle. Jungle. I think I would, I'm more interested in abandoned places, something that humans build and then record in there, like under like tunnels, bunkers and all of that stuff. Caves are also very interesting, but I tend to get uh, like the worst thing that I can watch is uh, spelunking videos when people go through these tight tunnels. I would never, never be able to do that. But I remember seeing stuff about Aztec underwater lakes documentaries and oh, just to be there to just capture that sound would be lovely or just to play, to perform, or maybe just to listen to the sounds there. Jason Gonzalez, from a musicologist and or layperson's perspective, how would you describe what makes music experimental or ambient? For example, what are qualities of artists like Steve Reich and Terry Riley that makes them fit into these types of classifications? I'd love to hear other classifications you find interesting, whether you find this exercise tiresome even. Much love to you. All these classifications, they exist basically to sell product. So you can put it in a shelf, ambient, experimental. And um, I have long since resigned myself to live in that corner, even though like my music is not ambient from the way it is intended to be. I find it's listening music. And ambient music is a functional music. Ambient music is something you're not supposed to be listened to. It's, yeah, it's literally musical, musical furniture. And that's at least how Eric Satie intended it. And going around, don't listen, don't listen. No, no, no. And <laughs> telling to his audience when he did his uh, ambient pieces, his first ones. And um, so that functional aspect is not something that interests me in, in my music. I always go for more. There are hidden symphonic structures in there and I hope they pull you in and it's something where you you know, where you pick up and, oh, I want to listen to that more. I never designed for the purpose of background music. Ambient is derived from intention. And experimental music, that means embracing actual experiments. Like uh, when Steve Reich just uh, enjoyed the way two tape recorders would play against each other and then use this technique with other musicians and see what happens because you get these, these things that experiment 
that are actual experiments, musical experiments. And uh, yeah, thinking about Terry Riley and NC, there is a group experiment happening every time that is performed. And I think there was one comment on the video where I talked about like an experimental starter setup where one guy said, you don't need any money for experimental music. You can just go out and hit anything with anything and record that and release that. I was like, this is not an experiment beating stuff with sticks that's just that's something the humans have been doing forever so the cavemen made their first music like gook 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 and that was the beat it's not about just anything goes there has to be in my opinion a real interest in the experiment and in discovering something new not just making ding 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 sounds on something and say oh this is so experimental because it doesn't seem to follow any structure no there has to be this love of discovery in there. Paul Regnier. Hi, Heimbach. I would like your insight about ear protection. <laughs> with all the sound design experiments you're doing, creating feedback with effects, using test equipment and so on, I'm sure you've thought about some kind of safety net for years, avoiding them to explode. I have like ear protection that I use every time I go into a venue. I plug it in like because the worst times feedback happens and stuff like that is usually not during the show. It's during sound check. And the last time my hearing got really damaged was during a microphone feedback uh, on a rather badly run club with no sound guy and and just figuring out how stuff works and beep. I don't think there's that much permanent damage anymore. So I had horrible ringing tones in there, but that's all gone. But it was, it was horrible. So um, yeah, and that was the only time I hadn't followed my own rule of always putting in ear protection when I go to a venue, whether it is to play or to listen to a concert. At home, I've, uh, I never listen that loud usually. If there's a feedback, I can usually quickly duck away from it. And um, I tend to not wear headphones. Headphones are the easiest way to damage your hearing. So I've got speakers and now I've got, uh, uh, Hoof dynamic master on the whole uh, bus of the, yeah, you know, of the mixing board. So anything that's too hot gets uh, limited. So there's some protection already built in. Though I'd rather try to be careful. But yeah, microphone feedback, that's easily the worst thing. Michael Southard. My question is, what made you decide to start working with Patreon? Did you have any struggles early on? Can you offer any advice for someone who is thinking about starting their own Patreon page? Thank you. Huh, yeah, I I made a Patreon account and I think it took half a year before I actually used it and activated it. I wanted to have a good audience. That's the thing, like starting out when you've got no one, just having a Patreon in place while there's nothing anywhere on your channel, that doesn't work. It makes like, it looks bad if you've got like three people, five people following and you make like eight bucks, like, oh, what? There's, then probably not worth much then, right? So that makes a bad appearance uh, when you've got, when you start out like this. But I managed to have like, I think uh, 60 to 80 people coming in really early on, really fast. And uh, that helped in giving the whole thing momentum. And I carefully watched what everybody else was doing. I looked at Myla Melody's uh, um, Patreon, for example. I looked at Loop Pops and I looked at basically what everybody did. And I so I thought, what could work for me? And um, the key thing to Patreon is that people that support you on Patreon are in there to support you and to make to give more of you and what you're generally doing. So it doesn't have to be this thing where suddenly you have to do so much more. Like people tend to treat Patreon, I can't do this, then I have to deliver all the time and have to make much more than I already make. That's absolutely not the point. The assumption is that you're doing something good and people just wanna see more of that. And all the rest is bonus. And uh, that is how I treated all the tiers. So it's all, things that are nice and good to have, like the sound packs, for example, and I personally use them myself because they're so useful and they make me explore the instruments even more with the, with a, like with an extra edge. But that's, I mean, that's like two to three hours of extra work, but it's very useful and, and actually fun work. So, uh, helps, helps me, helps the Patreons, helps everyone to make music, which is good. And uh, 
then uh, I, I cut away like the highest tier, like the very high tier, for, uh, like uh, there's only one person still in there and uh, that's the $50 tier, the 15 IPS tier where I do one-on-ones. Those I had to cut after some time because I simply, like simply the time, the time was a problem. Time is like the most precious resource and trying to figure out when to meet, when to talk, that became pretty difficult. So that tier, uh, yeah, once that last person uh, who has been with there from the beginning and with whom I love chatting, uh, once he decides he doesn't want to do it anymore, I'm going to, yeah, bleed that tier. But um, yeah, that was the only one where it was great in the beginning uh, because it is, of course, it is a lot of money and it helped me a great deal. But at some point I said, no, no, every time someone leaves, I'm just going to make one less. So that was a bit more work than I could do with two kids and all this work that I already have to do. But don't think you have to do too much. Make it fit it very much to what you want to do and don't be afraid to change everything. Don't make the Patreon into a second job on top of the job that people are wanting from you in the first place. So that's my advice. Poor Rick. Hi Heinbach, I recently decided to delve into the crazy world see at Lombard and ordered the Zedrax organ and I'm really enjoying its broad range of expression. As a fellow Zedrax organist, have you any su suggestions with regard to technique or processing with pedals that helps the instrument achieve a bit more sustain without losing its stereo expression? Thanks, Rick. The answer is Coco Qantas. It really loves the Coco Qantas and um, I tried other delays but yeah, I kind of it kind of feel wrong. So, Coco Qantas is it if you want more sustain, more richness of tone. Yeah, it's the perfect partner for the Zetrax organ. I'm sorry that it's something this expensive, but it's an instrument for the ages, I think. Ah, wasn't there another Coco Qantas question? Ah, yeah, Gavinsky's iOS Music App Tutorials asked Heinbach. I most love songs for Coco. I would like you to talk in a generic way about what you think is the key to making these beautiful Coco Quantos type sounds without a Coco Quantos. Okay. Ah. It's hard. It's one of those things where um, the sum of the parts is more. And the key thing here are the excellently designed VCAs that the Coco Quantos has. They sound beautiful and the way the gain staging interacts with the chip in there. Because the sound of the Coco Quantos is all about gain staging and the chip, because you're constantly fighting bit loss. You only have eight bits. So you have to record hot, but not too hot so it, that it overdrives. So it's a very thin line you're always walking. And that makes you a better listener because you're constantly checking out what's going on. It demands of you to be in control of your instrument, so it makes you a better player. And it, this sounds all stressful, but once you master it, it's very playful and you enjoy the richness. And then, of course, all the modulation and the looping that this offers. I can't, for the life of me, find a way to recreate that with anything else. And that's because there's no thing that has this kind of 8-bit chipset that's really, yeah, that that would capture this challenge correctly. And you can do bit crushing stuff, but it's not the same because as soon as it becomes something like this is an option, you're not using it in that way. I can't tell you a good way to emulate the Coco Quantos because the Coco Quantos is so special and it would feel it will feel like an empty exercise. I'm sorry I can't answer it anywhere else. It's really just, yeah, get a Coco Quantos. John Smith. Hello, I've been listening to your new release and I've been loving it. Thank you. It's made me dig into your back catalog to reacquaint myself with your past works as well. I always, I, I've always loved your album The Heat. Can you tell me if there is a general creative technique, idea or equipment that you base the project around? Sounds like a lots of FM and a very organic sound. Probably my favorite works of your past. Ah, yeah, that's modular. That's all Eurorack modular. And uh, a lot of it was based on using low pass gates, FM, as you heard, and some wavetable oscillators such as the Piston Honda, which, uh, which yeah, made its way into my music a lot of the times. Much of the sound comes from the rich Schwemann DMF2 filter, which just, oh, 
yeah, that was great. Uh, it is great, I still have it. It just gives everything a nice rich tone. And it's the last album that I multi-tracked. Uh, no, Assertion still is multi-tracking, but to the extent that I multi-tracked uh, multi um, the heat and mixed in the box, uh, that that's the last one I really did to, in that extent with like 20 tracks, for example, like the opening track that had 20 different tracks and took me forever to yeah, to compile and to, to, to mix and get ready. And on the last track, which is one of my favorite, that's the first time I recorded a master track only to tape. I used the Nagara 3 and that was the way forward for me from then on. So the general idea is rhythmic, low pass gates, lots of FM and uh, yeah, then everything uh, multi-tracked into the computer adding effects and mixing there and sometimes overdubs using expert sleepers um, what's called ES3 module Jason Hoffman in How to Heinbach you mentioned that you always intended to make a living scoring theater productions and that Heinbach was a personal project as you've gained notoriety as Heinbach and built the Patreon following has your vision of what it means for a piece to be Heinbach he changed or how or has how you view the project. Is the project fulfilling in the same ways as it was intended, as it becomes more successful? Oh yes, it's super fulfilling. Let me tell you, like it's just to be able to make a living from from this, it's a dream come true. And I don't feel forced to do anything because I've always been open, so open anyway. So um, the only thing that I wish I had more now is time because time is, <laughs> I'm so there's so much I want to do and the time always feels so little and the video editing and everything that takes a lot away and um, I don't do stuff like simply make music without a camera on because I know I'll be sad that I don't have a visual to accompany the music in the end uh, because that's that is such an easy tool to make music get heard more just having a video to that and post that on Instagram or on YouTube. I maybe don't don't make as many tracks as I did when I was only doing music because there was average, averaging like, I don't know, 10 tracks, maybe a week. Now it's more like five. So it's a bit less music, which is still a lot. It's more than I can put out ever. Yeah, it makes me so happy that it that it is where it is right now. Especially now that theater is, yeah, was all canceled and the production that I'm doing now, the general budgets are going down. It's just budgets are getting slashed everywhere. And I think we're gonna see much more of uh, slash, uh, slashed budgets. So Heinbach has become a thing that, yeah, that helps me go create and live my life and my dream of just making music to make more music. And now I do exactly the music that I want to do. It feels incredibly empowering and I'm very happy that you all are part of that and listening. So yeah, thank you for that. Fano Poaya. I have the opportunity to record a band around the middle of next month. And I'm thinking of recording them one of two ways. All of my microphones into my mixer into one tape recorder or three tape recorders with my microphone spread across out each tape recorder. If it were you, which option would you choose and why? What would you think about that would help you make your decision? I would use one tape recorder, the best one, and record to that. Because syncing everything, like, how would you sync three tape recorders then? You are using SMTP code or... How do you pilot tone? How do you sync up all these tape recorders? I mean, it, you can have a backup tape recorder running at a different speed and uh, then pitch that up and add that in as an effect. I mean, as effects, you can use them if they are not too loud because they'll bleed into your recording. So hmm, I would use the best tape recorder that you have, place the microphones as well as you can and have everybody perform the best way they can do. I wouldn't spread out three tape recorders. Just focus, focus on the one tool and make that sound the best. Titus, do you still use Zoya? How have you found it after extended use? Hmm. I actually don't use it that much except for the presets that I have. So I put it into the signal chain, select one of Heinbach's ghosts, which are the presets that you can download. Uh, and then it's 
done. I haven't had the time to delve further into it. So it's still like the most amazing multi effect that I know in paddle form because of yeah the ways it made my dreams come true. But I haven't gotten to further program it. I don't have the time. I'm the Kobold. What do you use to get rid of tapers? Why would you want to do that? <laughs> Is there a way to completely get rid of it? <laughs> it's a uh, it's bordering on blasphemy here. So far I've heard of Isotope RX, uh, Waves, Z Noise, Dolby and DBX. I'm thinking a lot about getting something from DBX because from what I've read it works the best to supposedly completely move his while keeping the recording intact. But I figured I should get your opinion before I commit to purchasing something. I would never, never ever get completely rid of tape his. It's just a lovely thing to have. And even in my YouTube videos, you can you can hear a little hiss from the mixing board here. And I kind of like it, but what I do is attenuate that. And what I use for that is Isotope RX in standalone mode. So you can make use of the D algorithm, like the most intense. And that really removes all, it doesn't remove it. It tones it down to where it's barely noticeable or nicely noticeable. So yeah, Isotope RX standalone D mode. That works for me. Henrik Wieberg, Dion question here. I've just started playing this instrument and your presentation video has surely helped. However, I don't get how to make the tuning go as low as your D organ does. Patchpoint told me it's about how to patch it, but how? I mean, you could apply offsets and yeah just uh, send uh, an offset into the tuning so you can make it go lower i think that would work so yeah something that produces a steady uh negative um uh negative value put that into the uh, the frequency uh, modulation thing and then it will go low but i didn't do anything special to my dear horn i didn't do anything in that regard it's just how it is out of the box, basically. Maybe just record a little video of the lowest note and ask at patch point, like, is this the lowest note that you tune these to? Or can I, can this be tuned lower? I'm not sure if that's something wrong with yours or I don't know, but yeah, I didn't do anything special to mine. Daniel Cuthrell, for those of us who can't have a real piano in our homes, I was wondering if you had any tips for warming up a digital piano signal. Recording to tape has worked wonders, but still the digital attack can be so harsh. Yeah, transients, transients on digital piano, that's that's just horrible. So uh, yeah, use compressors. I like using the Klanghelm. If you use that, they've got a Wurlitzer preset. And if you tweak that to basically take away the transients, you get a softer response and that can help in even in balancing it out. Or just use samples that are already soft, like the stuff from Felt, which is pretty good. But then of course, it won't sound like a real piano. It will have this very felty, very softy uh, atmosphere to it. The Void Inclusive. Hi Heinbach, I wonder if you could talk a bit about your approach to Instagram and your content there when you started out compared to how you approach it now. I'm just starting to post some musical things there and I'm finding a lot of wonderful music and community. Thank you always. Ha, the Instagrambian community. That's funny. I mean, like there's a whole genre of people who basically became more known through Instagram and uh, the music that they posted there. And I uh, kind of like Sire Records is like uh, where I also release is uh, one of the proponents of Instagram beyond. And uh, it, it is a super nice community. Thinking about it, I don't think anything has changed that much. I still do a post almost every day. I post stories. I, um, I repost sometimes, but hardly ever. And what I'm now getting asked to do more is to, yeah, to basically repost stuff by people for like uh, albums or like to uh, promote stuff, which mostly I don't do. But for charity, for example, I help repost stuff and stories. I still like engaging with people on Instagram. I still like talking there. It feels, it feels like a very pleasant platform for music. Uh, certainly, certainly better than SoundCloud or anything. Keep up posting, do it regularly be nice to people, interact, also follow, show interest. I think that works well. Hello, Heimbach, greetings from Arkansas. Hi to Arkansas. Quick modular question for you. Since I first began exploring this crazy rabbit warren that is modular synthesis, I have been very fascinated with the whole West Coast style of doing things. 
So, on the subject of low pass gates, which sounds better to you is active or passive and do you have a personal favorite? The Borg one with the white knob by Weird Maleko. I had to sell mine because basically I changed my rack so much that I couldn't fit all the weird in there anymore. And I kind of miss it. And the second one that I really like is the old Optimix. I don't think the newer ones ring as long, at least from what I've heard. The older ones ring nicely. So those are very clever. They don't sound as rich as the Maleko Weird one, but they are very clever in the way that they are playable. I haven't tried any other low pass gates. I have one passive one, I think, yeah, that I didn't really enjoy. I didn't really, yeah, get anything cool out of it. No nice, good ring. So active one and the Maleko Weird Borg one. Captain Nal, how does the music that excites you now differ from the mu music that excited the younger Heinbach? How is it the same? Younger Heinbach, ha, he was uh, looking for identity very much in music. <laughs> so uh, it was also way before it was Heinbach. So it sounds kind of strange saying it like that. But uh, young me, of course, looked for identity. So um, I preferred loud music with guitars. I listened to a lot of metal and I thought, ah, this is this has a thing. This is powerful. That anger and that power that was something I was interested in. It spoke to me as a young human male and um, but that quickly changed when I started to discover music that was more in, uh, experimental and through John Peel on the radio. The music that uh, I'm inspired now is still music that has an element of surprise to me. Something that I think I can learn something from, something where I think this is new, this shows me a new world. It's like opening a new page in a book. You, you, hi Heinbach, please show us more Syntrax if you're still using it. Of course I am, of course I am. But I've done so many Syntrax videos already. I don't feel the need to do any more with them. I don't feel the need to do special Syntrax videos because now this is just part of the instrumentarium. It's sitting right here and I use it all the time in my music. I've made even an overview video. Lou Papa has made an over overview video. I've made a whole album with it. I feel I've had my say in regards to YouTube on the Syntrax. I might return to it in a few years if there's any reason to, but um, right now I don't feel the need and I don't think people will watch it also which is something I also have to consider because making a video is three days of work and if nobody watches it, why would I do that then? Jakob Stevens, hello, thinking of Bio Innovation Summit and curious about your thoughts. On Instagram, thaw, on Instagram it sounds like maybe yours got sick. Yep, it died on me. So it used to sit here right under my desk and I really, really enjoyed it. It's so nice to have like a modern synthesizer because all the rest that I have is old stuff. I love the layout. I love all the possibilities that you can get with the arpeggiator. I like its dusty digital sound. It replaced the Yamaha TG33, which I had for the longest time uh, for me, for these kind of sounds. It has a certain, yeah, a certain spot where it really can do very emotive uh, pads and sounds. I never used it for like bread and butter stuff because for bread and butter, I've got a Juno sitting over there and any synthesizer you pit against the Juno, it's just gonna lose. <laughs> it's just gonna be like, nah, Juno does it better. Nah, Juno does it better. But for all these, um, yeah, these very special, digital, interesting, like, ah, here's something tickling. These sounds, I loved it. And I started making a preset pack for it. But yeah, now it's dead, it's boxed up and it's waiting to get picked up for repair. So yeah, kind of sad. I really, really miss it. Such a, such a cool synthesizer and such a, yeah, such a nice thing to have as a centerpiece because this controlled also all the MIDI. <laughs> so now I'm almost out of MIDI here. I still have the vector sequencer, but again, I played the the novation into that. Meh. So yeah, I miss it. Those were all the questions. If you have a question, just join any tier on the Patreon and then look for the regular sticky thread and ask away there. Your support is much appreciated and you are the reason I can keep on making these videos. You are the reason I can do Heinbach, basically. You are, yeah, awesome. Thank you for that. That's it for today and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.